Welcome everyone to our Legal Tech Institute program today. My name is Joe Lawson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Harris County Law Library and this first slide is sort of a sales pitch so that's why we can get started while everybody's still walking in. But uh, uh, the Legal Tech Institute is a program from the Harris County Law Library. It's about a year old now and through this we present learning opportunities on uh, legal tech, all sorts of legal tech ranging from the very practical like we have today uh, to the more out there. Last month we had a program on artificial intelligence uh, in the law titled The Robot Lawyer and that was uh, from the Director of Knowledge Management at Norton Rose. So uh, it really spans the gamut as far as uh, the type of legal tech topics and um, any program that we have we also record as you can see in the back there. Uh, so if you do have a question speak up so my microphone can, can grab that and then we'll uh, make those recordings available online. All those recordings carry the same CLE accreditation that our live programs do, so if you want to check that out, I believe we have five programs up right now that you can get an hour CLE for each program on our website. Uh, the number, the course number appears at the end of the, uh, the program and the dates that that is good for are on the, uh, the landing page. So just check out our, our uh, website there, harriscountylawlibrary.org slash tech, and you'll see those programs as well as this one in a few weeks after I uh, have a chance to edit it. That's the benefit of being the speaker and the editor. I get to make myself look good in all of the, uh, the recordings, right? <laughs> all right, so today's program is finding and formatting legal forms. Uh, as you know, you might know, this is a very popular topic. Our uh, RSVPs filled up very quickly. We are, of course, in a slightly smaller room here because um, our typical uh, conference space is on the lower level of this building and uh, I believe the last count was six inches of water during Harvey uh, in that level and so some walls are missing drywall and that sort of thing so we decided to not subject it to that and go ahead and uh, have the program up here. Uh, the law library is part of the uh, Harris County Attorney's Office and so this is one of their conference rooms and we're very happy that uh, we can partner with the practice group on this floor, uh, the uh, uh, CPS and Protective Services practice group to make this available to you. Additionally, the CLE credit today is provided by the uh, Harris County Attorney's Office CLE Committee. All right. Wanted to uh, just let you know who is presenting to you today. Uh, as I said, my name is Joe Lawson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Law Library. Um, I uh, graduated law school in 07, so everything I did was on a laptop and, and legal tech was just part of uh, how I learned everything, but of course, uh, things have changed since then, so there's a lot of uh, upkeep just in law library work and assisting folks with uh, their legal work downstairs. Additionally, we have Heather Holmes. She earned her MLS, Master of Library Science from UNT, and uh, has a lot of experience over at South Texas helping law students learn everything they need to learn to prepare for the practice of law. Uh, then she came over uh, with us in the past uh, couple of years here, and uh, we've been uh, working on this Legal Tech program, or Legal Tech Institute uh, programs ever since. Uh, this is all of our contact information, email addresses, as well as all the social media that you can find us. So if you have questions after today's program, feel free to give us, you know, well, I'd say give us a call, but the one thing that's not up here is, <laughs> is our phone number. Send us an email, uh, post, uh, message, whatever, Instagram us, whatever you want to do. All right, so let's start off with just some existential type questions. You know, why do we use forms? Uh, what are forms? And then uh, what can forms do for me? Uh, so, why forms? Um, there are three basic reasons why I say that uh, forms are a good thing in, in uh, legal practice and drafting. Uh, first, it's a time saver, of course. Um, you know, uh, lawyers who always start with a, a blank page on their Word document don't necessarily get a whole lot done, so it's good to have a place to start from. Additionally, if you're representing yourself in court, uh, you may not have time to go to law school for three years and then start from that blank page. So it's regardless of whether you're representing a client or uh, representing yourself, forms are a good place to start so that you don't have to uh, spend all the time from scratch. Additionally, there are some uh, government requirements. There are some, a few, very few forms, but a few that are required to complete certain tasks in uh, the legal community. We'll talk about that. But also, any forms you find that are dra uh, drafted, assembled by legal experts for your use are taking into account the legal environment that they're supposed to work in. And so there are some requirements in legislation and, and from cases that, that will be uh, just in this form because somebody who knows the area of practice has put it together for you. So that's, uh, that's another reason why it's good to uh, uh, start with the form. 
Additionally, you know, the maxim, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, you might waste time if you just start from scratch and come up with the exact same form that's already available out there. And large firms know this. A lot of large firms have brief banks and uh, uh, knowledge management systems where if one attorney in the large firm uh, comes up with a, a brief or, or a contract or something that'll work in other scenarios, they put it into a collective place where they can all pull from it so they have a starting place and that helps you uh, accomplish more in a shorter period of time and make sure that you hit all the uh, uh, legally required um, uh, legal requirements for that specific uh, topic. Okay, so let's move on to the second question. What are forms? And, and this is, we know from our, our work at the reference desk downstairs, this is a little bit more complicated question than, than you might, uh, might think it is. Most people think of forms as this, which is, you know, the, the type of forms you get when you go to get a driver's license or something like that, very regimented, very fill-in-the-blank style forms, and, and that's type one. Sometimes these types of forms are mandatory. The one example that I have up here is uh, colloquially called the BVS form in family law courts. Um, BVS stands for Bureau of Vital Statistics, and so this is actually form VS-165, but it's the only form that's used repeatedly in family law courts, and so it's actually earned the name of the agency uh, because it's so ubiquitous. But uh, this is the type of form that you have to complete this if you want to uh, meet the requirements uh, in some family law cases, and so you have to be able to find this exact form. Additionally, it's persnickety. You have to print it double-sided. You can't print it two-sided. So this, I'm, I'm giving you all these details just to show you that there are some forms like this out there that are mandatory, fill-in-the-blank style. Uh, but very few, as you'll see as we move along here. Uh, the places to find these are usually on the website of the agency that publishes it, these. So on this, uh, for this particular case, you can find this form on the Bureau of Vital Statistics website. It's going to be mixed up with all the other forms that they put together and publish. And so it might be a little bit hard to find there. Uh, usually what you want to do is look for the impacted agency. In this case, that's going to be your district clerk that has to insist on accepting that form with things like family law filings and that sort of thing. And so they make it very easy to find. They make it very easy to fill out. If you go to their website, you can get um, a copy that allows you to fill in the blanks right there on the computer, and they make it very easy for their employees to read once you do file it. So uh, if you want an easy version of these types of mandatory forms, uh, make sure that you look for the, uh, the impacted agency. Another example of this are like the JP courts. They have their, uh, uh, their cover sheet that's required by the state Supreme Court, uh, very easy to find and fill out on their website. Additionally, you have another option. Westlaw Official Forms is a very specific database that we have available downstairs that uh, pulls a lot of different forms from places like uh, federal courts and federal agencies as well as any state agencies that, uh, that it can find um, that put all these together and allow you to search through these forms using the Westlaw algorithm. So Heather will take a look at that and that just makes it a lot easier to find what you're looking for. All right, the second type of form is also a uh, government agency produced but it's uh, what I would call a permitted form. So there are some forms out there that um, uh, for instance, like the application for protective order that come with uh, the Supreme Court of Texas order saying that it's not required, but courts have to allow it to be used. So if you look for uh, forms like this, you usually find those from the government agency uh, where um, they're published. So in this case, the, the Texas Supreme Court has put this together. So you'll find it on the Office of Court Administration website where all of the Supreme Court approved forms are collected. Mm -hmm. Additionally, JP courts operate like this. They produce forms to try and standardize the process, but there are ways that you can, uh, you know, it, it, these are permitted rather than uh, mandatory in some cases. Uh, so you want to look for that. Additionally, uh, federal courts uh, have a lot of these. So if you go to uscourts.gov, there's a link for uh, forms right on the homepage and it gets you to these forms. They're largely also fill in the blank style and they're just meant to sort of standardize processes that take. Uh, take effect over and over. Additionally, legal aid websites like the one for Texas, texaslawhelp.org, are um, uh, creating a lot of these forms and also put these forms uh, that come from state agencies like the Texas Supreme Court uh, into their uh, into their system. So you can find them uh, on their website, uh, very, uh, very easy to find and fill out, and they try and make it easy for uh, people representing themselves in court to find these forms that are permitted. Okay, and then type three is actually the most 
uh, prevalent type of form, and the, these are the forms that we'll be discussing mostly today, and those are guidance forms. Uh, these are largely uh, published by attorneys who are experts in the field that they're, they're writing on, and so they'll put together forms for West Publishing or Lexis, and then those will be sold uh, to practitioners uh, in the form of books or databases, and then also to law libraries, and that's what we have available downstairs mostly. Uh, these are much more wide-ranging than the forms that you'll find from the government agencies just because the, these forms are uh, trying to cover entire practice areas of laws rather than the very standardized uh, topics that the, the government agency mandatory and permitted forms are, are dealing with. So um, uh, just the other day, you know, we, we had to look for a uh, petition on personal injury in an auto accident uh, involving uh, an insurance company and so there was an actual form with that title and the person who I helped uh, uh, find that was very pleased that that, that existed. Of course uh, she wasn't pleased that it wasn't fill in the blank style and, th and that's another um, characteristic of these forms. They're usually in the form of a template uh, rather than fill in the blank style and the reason for that is because the end product isn't supposed to look like uh, the you know uh, DPS uh, uh, driver's license application. It's supposed to look like a court document. And so um, what uh, Heather will be talking about are whoop, uh, all the different ways that you can find those. Most often those come from commercial databases like Westlaw, Lexis, and O'Connor's. Um, and so those are the three that Heather will talk to you about how to find forms. And then uh, I just want to make a quick note here. The places where you can't find those yet are on the free databases that the State uh, Bar Association makes available to all attorneys throughout the state for free. Those are Fast Case and Casemaker. Uh, those databases are for primary law only at this point. However, uh, Casemaker just acquired the entire Aspen library, so I don't know if anybody uses those sets, but uh, pretty soon you may have a chance to find forms and practice materials on Casemaker. Uh, not yet though, so we'll be focusing on the ones where you, you can find these. Additionally, legal aid websites like Texas Law help make these available, and um, usually those are written uh, as fill-in-the-blank style, but they're uh, not the government approved ones. They're just trying to help people representing themselves in court find um, uh, ways to put together a format that will be acceptable in court. Uh, for practicing attorneys, what you, what you might be interested in is if you need uh, some, some quick forms like a quick affidavit that's laid out with just blank lines and a notary block at the end or um, a service member's affidavit or something like that for default judgment. Uh, Texas Law Help does have some good examples there, so that, that might actually be something that you can look at even if you're a practicing attorney just to have a template since another Texas attorney has drafted that. It might be a good place to start. Additionally, the law library shelves, of course, uh, have uh, plenty of books and we have tens of thousands of these types of forms, uh, very specific, that we're happy to help you find. Of course, when, if you do do book research, uh, Heather's going to tell you how you can uh, translate that into the electronic resources so you can get something editable. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Heather, who's going to talk about the finding portion of uh, our CLE today. Okay, thank you. All right. So we in the library have access to Westlaw, Lexis, and O'Connor's absolutely free of charge. Uh, we have each of the databases, Westlaw and Lexis, on five different computers. And um, there is just about always an opportunity to use one of those computers to access the information you need. And of course, forms is what we're here to talk about today. So we're going to start with Westlaw. Uh, in Westlaw, there is a form finder. So you access it just from the home page by clicking on this forms link. There are a few different ways to go about finding forms once you land on that form finder page. You can either search by state, so you can select Texas for your jurisdiction. You can search using the advanced search feature. Or if you scroll down the page, you'll actually find forms by publication. And we're going to look at, at each of these individually. So first of all, if we just did an advanced search within Westlaw, that would let us do a search very broadly for forms. Um, it provides a template that allows you to limit your results to include only civil or criminal forms, transactional or litigation forms. You can also narrow your search uh, by selecting a search topic so you can specify which particular area of law you're interested in to, to uh, locate a form that you are looking to find. Um, and so this is a general, broader way to go about doing your search, although it does give you some opportunities to narrow down uh, by limiting your results to those topic areas and um, 
to the type of form that you're looking for. Uh, we can also, as I mentioned, do searching by a uh, particular p publication. So there are different ones here to look at. Um, there are, there's a complete manual of criminal forms. There are federal procedural forms. But the one that Joe was mentioning, um, these Westlaw official forms, is a really good database because this is, a, this is a database of a lot of the government forms that you can access from government websites. Um, and they're compiled for you in one particular place. So the Westlaw official forms, as I mentioned, oftentimes have things like bankruptcy forms, social security forms, um, patents. Um, if we looked at immigration forms, for example, and narrowed it down to specifically the Department of Labor, we could find something like an application for a per permanent employment certification. So it's just as easy. You drill down through the, through the list of topics, and um, you would click on that link to take you to the search results page and it gives you the form and when you click further you'll see that there are some PDF downloads so you can actually download the document in a editable format so you can type right into the form and it will produce a really nice form for you that's all typewritten and you can then just print it out so this document is 15 pages long and it's um, you know the official government United States Department of Labor uh, form that you need for that particular purpose, so that's a really good place to find it instead of having to go to that Department of Labor website and seek out the individual form through the list of who knows how many forms they would have available. This is a nice way to uh, use the search features of Westlaw and uh, leverage all of the technology that they make available to um, enable easier searching of forms. So if we went back to that form finder page and we were going to search uh, for Texas forms, we would select Texas that would take us to the Texas Form Finder page. And you can narrow your forms by topic, so you can choose a specific area of law if you want to go about it that route. Or if you did a search for a specific topic, um, maybe you're looking for a motion for summary judgment. So if we type that into the Texas Form Finder search bar, uh, that would give us 2,074 results, which is entirely too many forms to sort through. It's just not <laughs> manageable. <laughs> so we can narrow by facets. And so if we selected, um, we could narrow, we already have by Texas, and we can also look at the different form types. So if we select ready to build, we get only 23, which is a much more manageable number of forms that we can sort through. Um, if you wanted to look at the other form types, there are also text forms, which are um, sample contracts and other agreements that you can download and then edit to fit your situation. There are checklists, which are listings of key components for any given legal document um, or legal matter. There are also um, clauses that are sample language from contracts and other legal documents that you can copy and paste into your drafting application and then f modify to fit your needs. So there are different ways to narrow down uh, the different form types even further. But as I said, we selected ready to build forms that allowed us to narrow our search results to 23. And if we scroll down the list, at number six we find just what we're looking for, a motion for summary judgment. And we can read through and identify this comes from West Texas Forms. We know that's a good, reliable source, as are all the sources provided by Westlaw. Uh, but we have some reassurance in knowing that this is the form we need because the topic description um, gives us a little blurb there to kind of tell us what that form is all about. And when we click on that link, it takes us to um, the form, which is nicely displayed here, but it's not in any kind of format that you can use. Uh, there is a tool called the Easy Edit feature, and when you click on this button, it allows you to open the form um, as an RTF file, which will automatically download in whatever drafting application you use. So typically for most of us, I'm sure that that's probably Microsoft Word, uh, and it will download a Microsoft Word, but if you do use micro, uh, WordPerfect or some other word processing application, it will actually open in whatever application you use. So that's a really good way to find a nice form that you can edit, and when you do that, um, you click on the Easy Edit link, it removes all the extraneous information, including publication headers, footers, copyrights, Westlaw links. It removes all of that, and the document is automatically opened in your drafting application, as I mentioned, so it's ready to go. So we can also find forms in a, in a, in a couple of other ways, too. We can search secondary sources. So if we were to scroll down that page on the Form Finder landing, home, landing page, we would find secondary sources. We could actually narrow it down to forms even further. And we could find legal practice forms, um, texture pleading in practice, and West Texas forms. So for instance, we had done maybe some research in the print resource already, and we know what form we needed to find. We were looking for that motion for summary judgment. We found it in Chapter 11. We could go directly to West Texas forms and search for it that way by browsing within the source. 
The other way to access that same title would be to do a search within the search bar. So this is just on the home page, the Westlaw home page. I just typed in West Texas, starting to look for the form, and it already guesses what I'm looking for. It says looking for this, West Texas forms. Yes, in fact, that's what we need. So we could select that. It would take us to the table of contents for that source. We could drill down, look for <coughs> chapter 11, and find that very same form that we located by uh, by doing the browse search earlier. So it's the motion for summary judgment. Again, it opens in that same format. We can click the easy edit button, view it as a Word document. So there are different ways of accessing the same form. But um, sometimes a lot of our self-represented litigants especially will come in and use the um, print resources first and identify the form that they need and then they'll go to the, the database to look up the form that way. So um, as I say, there are many different ways to approach this. And in Lexis, the same thing. It's set up actually quite in a much similar fashion. Um, you can access the forms again multiple different ways. You would go to the form finder in Lexis Advance. You can choose your jurisdiction, Texas. Now we're in the Texas form finder. If we do a search again for motion for summary judgment, we get our list of search results. Uh, here we have 35 forms, which is a manageable list. But if we narrow it down further, we can actually select motion for summary judgment and there are just seven forms under that particular subject heading. And if we look at this first one here, the first one we, we, we might like, it's a motion for summary judgment by defendant. It comes from the Texas Litigation Guide. We like that source, so we choose that. And we open the form. Now this doesn't have the easy edit feature like Westlaw does, but it does allow you to um, print the document. It does allow you to download it to a jump drive. You can email it to yourself. So there are multiple different ways to access the form once you've located the actual text of it. Um, also within Lexis, there are the secondary materials search. So we can scroll down on that form finder search page to secondary materials. We can identify the sources that we, what we want. Um, litigation guide, transaction guide, criminal practice guide. All of these are very popular, of course. And um, if we selected the litigation guide and we chose chapter 100 because perhaps we've already done some research in the print volume and we know that chapter 100 is about summary judgment. We could find the form that we need and access it there. And as I mentioned, there are the features where you can print, download, or email the document to yourself. And we have a copy center in the, in the library, so you can print your documents for 10 cents a page, or you can download them free of charge to your jump drive or email them to yourself. And um, that's pretty much how you would find forms in Westlaw and Lexis. Now, a third database, which um, maybe you might have a little less experience with, but is equally valuable, is O'Connor's online. And this is, um, as we all know, a wonderful source in print, but it's also set up very nicely in an electronic format. It's, it's designed to mimic the print format, so it's very usable. It's, um, it feels user-friendly. It's something you're familiar with. So there are different ways to approach um, the search in O'Connor's, just as with the other databases. They give us a few different options. So if we chose, for instance, pretrial and trial procedure, it would take us to a list of commentaries and forms. So under the forms list, it then breaks it down into federal and Texas. And then further within Texas, if we're looking again for that motion for summary judgment, we might want to choose disposition without trial. It gives us this table of contents that you see here on the right. And then chapter 7, in fact, is about disposition without trial. And chapter uh, form 7C1 and C2 are both motions for summary judgment. We could click on either one of those. And um, that's one way of going about finding it. You can also just do a search on the home page for motion for summary judgment. And uh, when you do that, you're going to get a list of search results that may not be entirely forms, but on the left you have filters. So you can again filter, choose forms. There are 60 of them. So if we select that link, it will take us to, again, uh, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment, defendant's motion for summary judgment. So that's another way of accessing those same forms. And however we access it, ultimately we'll get to this uh, form here. So it looks just like what you would see in the O'Connor's book. This is not something you can edit just as is, but it does have this nice download feature so you can download it either as a Word document or as a WordPerfect file. And it looks just like this, and now it's ready to go. Everything that's in brackets, you replace with your information, you customize it to make it your own legal form. And, um, and there you have it. That's how you can find a lot of good forms in the three main legal databases. And as I say, these are all freely accessible in our library and our collection, so we welcome you to come and use them. And if you have any questions about how to access any of these, because I know that there are different ways, and it gets confusing sometimes to know just exactly how to approach your search, um, we're happy to help you with that. And I'm going to turn it back over to Joe and he'll talk about how to format those forms for you and um, 
lets you know why it's important to format your documents in uh, the proper way. So, Joe? Let's see. Thank you, Heather. All right, excuse and me. And it looks like we're standing room only now, so uh, <laughs> uh, don't mind Heather in the corner of the room there. <laughs> All right, so um, switching gears to talk about formatting. Um, I like to ask myself why before I go down a whole string of, of things that, uh, or a whole string of actions here. And so why do we need to learn about formatting and the practice of law? And there, there are three basic things that, that I think are important to keep in mind. Um, so from the state bar, lawyers have ethics that they have to comply with. Um, now, as, as far as I know, and I, I'm not licensed in Texas, I just want to <laughs> put that out there, but as far as I know, um, Texas, like Florida, has not adopted specific tech requirements. Is that right? Is that right? That's right. That's right. Great. Thank you. Uh, I've got my expert here in the front. <laughs> and so, um, so in Florida, you actually have to do CLE based on legal tech specifically. However, in, in, uh, in all states, uh, including my home state of Indiana, you have basic competency and confidentiality uh, requirements that translate into a legal tech environment. For instance, um, if you type of contract, you have to make sure that it's the right client name in that contract, right, to remain competent. And that's, that's extremely basic, but it involves uh, the tools that you use in order to type up that contract. Additionally, confidentiality. Uh, everybody know that when you send a Word document to somebody else, you're sending what you see on the screen plus what's called metadata. So you're sending information kind of behind the curtain there about the author, how many times it's been revised, uh, any comments that have been made. So if you send it to a client, they make a comment they send it to you and you send it to opposing counsel. If you don't shepherd that metadata, then you might be sending your client's comment directly to opposing counsel. And if you practice law, you know what sort of can of worms that, that is. So you want to keep in mind some things like that when you're learning about formatting. Additionally, there's some requirements with uh, e-filing. Uh, the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure now have specific rules about the type of format that the document has to be in. So it has to be in a uh, machine readable PDF that has been directly converted from the editing software, right? And th that's a paraphrase. Uh, you can find it in uh, 21F if you want to read it for yourself. But basically, you have to care about uh, the format of your document that you're refiling in order to care about uh, whether or not you're complying with the uh, rules of civil procedure as well as the um, uh, uh, the IT standards set by the state Supreme Court. And then finally, there are a lot of market forces out there. I, I mentioned already, you know, clients don't want to pay you every time to start from a blank screen necessarily. Additionally, um, uh, this, this drive has been almost standardized with what was called the legal tech audit. If anybody's heard of this, a few years ago, the in-house counsel for Kia Motor, Motors actually gave uh, large law firms a uh, legal tech test that they had to complete before they got the contract to represent Kia. He said he could complete the entire test in half an hour. He said, I'll give all the, uh, the lawyers taking the test two hours to do it. Um, he ended up having to give them eight hours and 10 law firms failed. So, so that has brought a lot of attention to the importance of um, attorneys who are doing a lot of drafting, making sure that they know how to use the tools that are available to everybody on the computers in order to save billable hours and create the right amount of value uh, required. Okay, so get ready to see a high wire act. I'm actually going to, in real time here, uh, complete these tasks with some real documents that we've downloaded from research like Heather has described here. So as we're going through this, uh, I'm going to switch back and forth to both some uh, litigation style documents, so a motion for summary judgment, and I'll also go to an LLC operating agreement in case we have any transactional attorneys here in the room. All right, so the first one here, find and replace. Uh, this was actually one of the more important skills on the legal tech audit. Um, has anybody used find and replace before? Great. Right. Every time I ask, I see more hands go up, so I'm very, very happy to see that. Um, but it's extremely important to be able to use these automated tools in order to go through your document with machine assistance in order to uh, go through quickly, but also to make sure that you catch um, all of the instances of maybe uh, if you're reusing a document, you're making sure you change all your client names, or if you're using one of the forms off of Westlaw or O'Connor's or Lexis to make sure that you're filling in all those blanks that are, that are indicated there. So 
Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the O'Connor's motion for summary judgment. And uh, just so you know, um, when you start off, it's going to look like this, and so you always want to go over here and, and zoom if you, uh, if you have the screen space so that it's easier to find. But um, uh, so this is what your document looks like, and uh, this is pretty indicative of how uh, forms turn up from commercial databases. They've got uh, the actual text that is supposed to appear in the form, right? So I've highlighted plaintiff. That should be in your final form, but where it says name, hopefully you've got something else in there before you file it with the court. So, uh, <laughs> all right. That's said a little tongue in cheek, but uh, when you get through like a, a you know an appellate brief that's uh, however 50 pages long or whatever, um, you know you might miss one or two of these. So I want to show you find and replace here. All right. So if we hit Control F, that's the hot key, or if we go up here into the upper right hand corner and click the find button. Um, in um, Word 2010 and before you'll actually get a little pop-up screen. In 2013 like I'm using here you'll get the little sidebar here that says navigation. But what you'll see here is is that I've typed in uh, the opening bracket and th that it, you just come up with that from a quick scan of the document. You can see that O'Connor's uses this as, as their option. We'll see a Westlaw form here in a minute that uses uh, just a, 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 a square bracket. But um, uh, so you want to type in just the opening bracket for whichever commercial database you're, you're in. Uh, for O'Connor's, it's this one. And as soon as I type that in, it gives me all instances of that. Right here on the side, we see 88 results. You know, now even if you pay attention to detail, that's a lot of results to make sure you hit as you're going through the document. So what you can do is uh, you can actually come over here and select these. It will take you to the exact spot in the document. Now you can see it's highlighted all these in yellow, uh, but the one that we're on is sort of grayed a little bit. So it tells you which one you're on, and then you can go over to the document and edit that. If uh, here we're actually in the title of the of the uh, motion for summary judgment, so we can say what type it is. But as you're going through over on the left-hand side, you have these uh, uh, up and down arrows, so you can go through, and as you edit, that should reduce the total number uh, significantly because the machine is actually searching for it to make sure you get all instances of that, and you can move through the document quickly to fill in uh, that information. Now, of course, uh, litigation documents like this in trial court are usually fairly short. But let me show you an instance of uh, the LLC operating agreement. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, just, uh, just quickly so I can uh, show you the difference here. Uh, this is a document downloaded as an easy edit document from Westlaw, uh, as, as Heather described. I'll zoom in a little bit here so we can see that. And you can see it, it's, it just starts directly with the title of the document and gets into the, uh, the meat of the document. However, if you downloaded it with the download format, which used to be the only option, you can see it's got headers up here and all of the book information there. And, and uh, you can see it's, it's just a lot easier uh, to work in the easy edit format. OK, so in this instance, uh, the, the first uh, example I have of the fill in the blank for a Westlaw form is right here with name. And it's got the square bracket, like I said. So when we uh, pull up our find menu here. We'll just want to make sure that we do a square open bracket. It gives us 40 results. Okay, of course, um, because this is uh, in the transactional world, what we like to do is um, the name of the organization is name. You'd fill in that actual name and then limited liability company. After that, it just refers to that entity as limited liability company. Of course, if you want to refer to a different LLC, um, then you might cause some confusion. So let's say we wanted to just have uh, the software here go through and replace limited liability company with the name of our client, for instance. So um, what we would do is uh, copy and paste this. All right. And one way to copy and paste is to highlight, right click, copy. And then we can come up here into our navigation search box and hit paste. OK, once we hit enter, it will hopefully. OK, let's try that again. Exit out, paste. There we go, 73 results. So uh, limited liability company appears here. 
uh, 73 times. So let's say I want to go ahead and uh, not go through and manually do all of those myself, um, but I would rather come over here to replace in the top corner of the screen. And so I want it to find limited liability company, and I want it to replace that with great LLC because that's the name of our, our client. Okay, so what you can do is do find next. It will go through and highlight each instance of that. Uh, if you hit replace, you can see right here on the screen, uh, and I'll point to it just so we know, it has replaced a limited liability company with great LLC. Now, of course, if we actually want to save time and not go through each instance, we can hit replace all, <coughs> and it will tell us that it replaced that 108 times. So you can see right, that right there has saved you enough time uh, just, to, just to learn this skill because you don't have to go through and do that. Now, of course, if you uh, do um, real estate or leases, you might want to change an address. If you do uh, contracts for the sale of products, you might want to change out the product name or something like that. So there are a lot of different uses for this feature uh, depending on your practice area. All right. The next skill I want to demonstrate is copy and paste, and uh, I've got an instance here of why you might want to use that. In addition to entire operating agreements or entire contracts on Westlaw, you can also download individual clauses. Uh, so this is a clause that addresses if I want a uh, manager manage LLC. Um, if you don't do that type of work, don't worry about it. But the point here is, is we want to copy and paste, so you've got two options for uh, selecting, you can select all. Now, what you can see is when I selected that, it actually went one space past uh, the period. When it does that, it's actually picking up a lot of the markup language. So we're talking about all of the font information, all the paragraph information, everything else. So one way to try and get rid of that so it doesn't affect your other document is just to hit shift, hold that down, and hit backspace. It gets rid of that markup space there, and it helps to get rid of some of that uh, markup information. Now, you have two options. You can hit Control C, or you can right click and hit copy. And then when you do that, you can go to your, um, uh, back to your, uh, your document here, and we can uh, insert that. Now, uh, you can hit Control V. What that is going to do is take any uh, font or uh, uh, formatting information from the original document, try to fit it into this document. Uh, so let me just show you that. So you can see, and what it's done now is uh, it kind of looks like an old ransom letter where you cut stuff out of magazines and stuff, you know, and, and you don't want your final product to end up looking like that. So what you can do here is uh, I would suggest hitting Control Z, which is for undo, or hit the little button up here in the top left to undo that. Go back to where your cursor is and right click. And what you can see here are all your different paste options. Here we have three. The first one here is exactly what I did, where it pastes, but it takes all of the formatting information from the original document. Uh, this one here attempts to merge the two formatting options. Of course, that can have interesting results because the computer does it how it thinks it should happen and not necessarily how you think it should happen. And uh, lots of monitors has, have been thrown out of windows because of <laughs> this option. So use that with caution. The one that I like the best is the one with this capital A here. And what that does is it gets rid of all the formatting from the first document that you've copied from, and it just pastes the words, right? So let, let's take a look at what happens when I do this. All right, so you can see now, um, and oh, since I uh, came, from, uh, came from right here, it actually kept the italicized. But uh, uh, what you can see here is that it's the right font size. It hasn't uh, put any sort of extra tabs in there. It hasn't put any extra spacing, nothing like that. So that's a way to save yourself some headaches when you're copying and pasting. Uh, copying and pasting, of course, is a fantastic use for um, you know, grabbing clauses or grabbing paragraphs from old pleadings if you have a similar situation but you're working on a new client's document or something like that. All right, let's take a look at the, uh, the next one here. Uh, footers is something that uh, sometimes gives people headaches and um, this was on the, uh, the legal tech audit and one of the, uh, the biggest failings of uh, the <laughs> large law firm attorneys, so I want to make sure 
that we discuss this. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, we can see in our um, LLC agreement there are no page numbers, for example, and you want to automatically insert page numbers. This is a very simple, uh, simple use of this, but something that uh, is necessary in a lot of instances. Okay, so one way to do it is just to move your mouse to the bottom of a page, double click. It's going to open the footer so that you can insert something in the footer. Okay. Uh, once you do that, up here at the top are your header and footer tools. These are things that are specifically for that. Um, and page numbers are very useful, so you have it right here. We want it at the bottom and then right-hand side of the page, and it's going to show you what it's going to look like ahead of time. This is uh, good because uh, when you have something in a gray box like that, what it means is that the software is tracking uh, any changes. So if you insert a page ahead of time, it'll just take care of the page numbering the rest of the way down and all that sort of thing. Uh, so that's nice to insert uh, those, types of, uh, those types of things. Additionally, you have other quick parts here. Uh, does anybody still use like the file path name at the bottom of a client letter so that you know where to find it again? Okay. Um, that's probably good unless you don't mind everyone saying how you organize your files on your computer. But uh, j just so you know, there are ways to insert those types of things with fields. So if you are editing inside the office and you want to know who the author of the document is or who the author of this iteration of the document is, you can do that. Uh, you can put uh, how many times it's been edited. You can put the uh, current date. Uh, so if you are creating a client letter or something like that, uh, you might want to put the current date in so that you can uh, just have the software updated. Uh, so, but the, the, where you find those types of things and where you can find the thing that's most useful to you is under Quick Parts and then Field. And it will, will insert that for you. All right. Once you're done uh, editing your footer, you go up here to Close Footer. <laughs> it's going to appear. Um, on, on every page at that point because it's a footer. Okay. Uh, one other thing just to point out here. Uh, if you are doing something like a brief where you need the uh, page number not to be on the first page, you can click here, different first page, and it will remove the first page number, or at least it should. All right, let's give that one more, more try. All right. Oh, okay. Here we go. All right, so if, if uh, you click uh, different first page, that's this checkbox here, it will remove that uh, auto um, quick part from what, just the first page so that you can have a cover page or something like that. Additionally, um, sometimes we need to do a uh, table of contents or something like that. Um, what we would do with that is just insert a section break at the end um, of the of the table of contents. So d uh, does anybody do like a pellet briefs or anything like that? Yes? Okay. All right. So let me show you this real quick just so you know. Um, okay. So the, um, uh, what you might want to do is try to insert a uh, page break or something like that, but you um, uh, don't do that basically, <laughs> basically is, is the point that, that I want to make to you because um, if you insert a page break, or it just basically inserts a blank page, you're not going to you're not going to come up with the option that you want. Um, and of course, as soon as I start talking about this, I lose where the break is page on my layout. page layout. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, breaks, right. Excellent. So um, uh, insert a page break or uh, a continuous break. All right, so let me uh, come back into the footer so you can see this. Take the different page off. Okay. And then we want to page layout, break. Okay. And continuous break. Um, okay, that's not working. If you need to do that, come down to the law library. I'll pull up my <laughs> help file on that. We'll get that taken care of for you. That usually does work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, High Wire Act, it only works because I'm at the front of the room. As soon as I get to my desk, it'll work perfectly. <laughs> as it turns out, it did work perfectly once I got back to my desk because I remembered the second very important step. After you've inserted the section break, you can go back to your footer, right click your page number, and click Format Page Numbers. At this point, uh, if this were your table of contents, you would likely want to change the number format 
to a lowercase Roman numeral. Once you do that, click OK. You can see that and it does in fact change that. When you scroll down to your second page, you'll see the Arabic numeral 2. Um, and the reason for that is because the format is specific to the section. However, if this is in fact a new section, you would want it to start over at 1. The way you do that is by selecting the page number here. Right click and click Format Page Numbers. At the bottom of this pop-up you can see uh, there's a second selection called Start At. And at that point you can have the section start over uh, numbering from page 1. Once you click that and click OK, you'll see the first page of your second section is the number 1. The second page of your second section is page 2. And if we scroll all the way back up to the top, the first page of your document, which uh, would likely be your table of contents here, or some introductory pages, is lowercase Roman numeral I. And that's all there is to it. So let's look at the next one here, templates. So uh, the whole point of the form is so that you have a starting place uh, whenever um, you start drafting a document. So what you can do is, when you find a document that you'll be able to use in a number of different client settings, so for instance, a uh, uh, client engagement letter is something that you want to send to, to every client. Um, uh, client breakup letters or something you only want to send to a few clients, right? But you still might want to be able to uh, have those as a recurring document. Uh, what you're going to do is uh, go to your document and instead of saving it, you're going to go to Save As. Um, in this case, I'll save to my desktop. But um, uh, down here under Save Type As, you have the option to save just as a Word document. That's just going to be one iteration of this. Uh, but you also have the chance to come down here and save as a Word template. And so what that's going to do is every time that you double click on that, um, okay. And just to make sure that I know where it is, I'm going to go ahead and uh, title it with template here. Um, file management is always a good thing. Indeed, file management is a good thing. And during the live program, I was unable to find the template file that I was attempting to save, which leads us to a teachable moment. As you can see at the top of this menu, uh, the file path actually changed to a template folder rather than the desktop where I had intended the file to go. And so when you're saving files as a different file type, be sure to check the file path and make sure it's going to the folder you intended to uh, land in. Once you do find your file, it'll look like this. And you'll see that it has the .dotx extension at the bottom and a different icon than a usual Word document. Um, that lets you know it's a template file, and when you right-click on that file, what you'll see here you have uh, a new option called New, which means it's going to open a fresh Word document with all of the uh, saved information to that template. However, if you want to change the actual template file, which means uh, how the Word document opens each individual time that you open it, then you would go to Open. Once you open the template file, you can see at the top it still retains that .dotx extension letting you know that you're working inside your template. And you can make changes that will then take effect every time you uh, double click the template file to open a new Word document to start on. Um, places where this might be of interest uh, for legal work are things like client engagement letters where you're going to be sending something substantially similar every time or at least you can start from the same place. Uh, so for things like letters, um, of course, you're going to want the current date for when you're writing the letter, which Word will allow you to insert automatically. So um, if you're at the place in your Word document where you would like to insert the date, you can actually insert that in the template so it will provide today's date every time you open that. The way you do that is uh, go up to the Insert tab, come over here to Quick Parts, and click field. Uh, now there are plenty of fields here just like we saw um, with your options in the footer. Uh, the field that we're talking about now is date so you click on that and this 
middle box is called Field Properties. Uh, you can change the layout of the date to how you want it. And the description, of course, is today's date, letting you know that uh, when you open uh, the new file, it will insert that day's date. Uh, when you click OK, it inserts it. And it looks like um, uh, just any other date, but when you click on it, you can see that it's one of those grayed out fields uh, so that uh, the software will actually uh, take care of updating that every time you open a new document. Let's take a look at cleaning metadata. So the example that I gave you before was uh, whenever you send a document, you also have metadata that is attached to it. One way to figure out some of the metadata that you have attached to a document is to go to the file on uh, wherever it's open, right-click that file, click Properties, and then we can go to Details. <coughs> And uh, in this section here, you're going to see things like who authored it, how many iterations there are, whether or not there's a previous version. So you can go back to old drafts that have maybe comments from your clients or comments that you've made that you sent to your client, uh, that sort of thing. So we want to be able to uh, clean that metadata up. One way to do it is right here. You can see at the bottom where it says remove properties and personal information. When you click on that, you have the options here to create a copy with all possible properties removed. That's going to remove things like previous versions, uh, authors, um, all, all the different types of things that you may not want to send along uh, uh, and anything that appears in this section. Uh, when you do that, it just saves it as I have it up here uh, with, okay, so I've done it here with the motion for summary judgment. And then right over here next to it, you can see it just says the exact same title with the name dash copy. And so that's how you can distinguish between the copy that has uh, those attributes and the copy that doesn't have the attributes. There's also a tool in Word uh, that you can use, and it actually does a little bit better job of cleaning up all the different Word type metadata elements that are available there. If you go to File, Info, uh, I've already got it selected here, but sometimes it'll uh, go on one of these other tabs. So make sure you hit Info. And then right here under Inspect Documents, you have uh, Check for Issues. So when we click on that, uh, Inspect Document is the first, the first one here. And you can see it's going to uh, inspect your document for all these different things, comments, revisions, and versions, and annotations, all the things you may not want the court or opposing counsel to see. Uh, document properties and personal info and all sorts of uh, other embedded information. Uh, macros, forms, and ActiveX controls are things that could allow a hacker to figure out how your computer's set up, so it's good to remove those as well. All right, so when we hit the inspect button with all those selected, uh, it's going to uh, give me this, and as you can see, it did find some stuff just on this document that uh, I haven't been working on very long. So it's, it's got uh, document properties and author, um, and uh, everything else it checked out for me. Um, now, if it's got the X at the bottom, that means it wasn't able to find anything there. Usually it means that there's not a whole lot there, but if you're concerned about those things, you can scroll through, read the descriptions, and see if you might need to uh, talk to an expert. But for most instances, we have this option to remove all, so I'm gonna remove all of my document properties. You can re-inspect if you want to. Typically, you come up with the same checkboxes, and then when you hit close and save, uh, you can save that as a document without all that metadata in the background. So that's, that's always a good option to do uh, before you send it along or before you save as a PDF document. Okay, um, and then I just wanna show you a few crowd pleasers here. These are things that uh, we have to do a lot, which are things like um, uh, insert a section symbol. Does everybody know the hotkey for this? Press down the Alt button and then hit two, then one on the number pad. It will appear right there. If you have a laptop like I have here where it's just the numbers across the top, uh, you just go to Insert, Insert Symbol, and you can find uh, the section mixed in with all the inserts. That's why it's, it's a good thing to learn the hotkey on your full-size keyboard if you can. All right. And then uh, paragraph spacing is something that's perplexed everybody since uh, Windows, what, 2003 came out, I think, uh, when they made the switch. All of a sudden, everything was single space, but when you hit enter, it bumped you down here um, so that you can see there's a space between the different paragraphs. If you ever want to get rid of that, you just select the area 
where you want to get rid of that or hit control A for the entire document. Up here in paragraph, you have the little uh, button down off to the side there where you can get all of your paragraph functions. And uh, right here under after, you just put in a zero for zero spacing. Click OK and it'll shorten that up. All right. uh, that's also where you can um, put in your double spacing depending on what type of uh, document you're, you're looking for, that sort of thing. All right, and then finally, if you want to save a document as a PDF, we come up here to the File tab, um, and this is the same, or it should be the same regardless of what uh, uh, Word application you have, 2007 and after. Uh, you can go to Save As, select your destination folder. In this case, I'm going to select the desktop. Uh, click your uh, Save As file type, and then PDF. Pretty straightforward, um, and that uh, now that is going to save with some of that metadata, so make sure before you do this step you've done your inspect document option, um, but once you hit save, you'll have a PDF here just like you have in most cases, and um, uh, this is uh, machine readable, so you can actually search these documents, you can copy the text, you can do that sort of thing. That's different from if you scan something and you haven't run it through OCR software, it's only going to capture a photo and you can't copy and paste or anything else. This converts it directly so you have all those. Okay, uh, before I move on, any questions about the formatting? Things? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, since this is a library program, we of course want to give you further reading. And so, um, a lot of the reading on this comes from blogs. Um, I don't know if anybody follows The Lawyerist, but if you, if you haven't yet, you can sign up for their newsletter and receive a free copy of a, a tech competence checklist, basic tech competence for uh, lawyers and law firms. Um, and it's, uh, it's a fantastic compilation of, of the skills that you need to be able to, to learn. Some of the things we discussed today are on that, on that checklist. Additionally, there's a, a great uh, uh, wiki type website called Office for Lawyers. This is where uh, different lawyers post things that they've learned in their practice. And so um, when you learn a skill, you can go here and find it under Word, Outlook, Excel, PowerPoint, all the different programs that, uh, that we tend to use. Additionally, we publish a Tech Tuesday post every Tuesday, more or less, on our uh, blog, Ex Libris Juris. So if you want to follow the law library, you can find information like that. And we also have access to things like uh, ABA publications like Microsoft Word, uh, 2013 or uh, all of the other uh, social media word processing type softwares that you use uh, in your practice uh, that are published by the ABA there. So a lot of those are on the law library shelves. Well, thank you so much and uh, look for our next program, <laughs> LexisNexis in November. We'll send out an email. And that's all there is to it. For more learning opportunities like this, including online tutorials and in-person training sessions, visit the Harris County Law Library's Legal Tech Institute website at www.harriscountylawlibrary.org tech.